So low pay is definitely as a result of low fees. Low fees are as a result of poor perceived value from the prospect. Poor perceived value from the prospect is a direct result of architects being crap at selling and marketing. Hello and welcome, Ryan Willard here, host of the Business of Architecture. And uh, I've got a little episode that we're going to do today where I'm going to be looking at a recent article that was published in the Architects Journal in the UK and I'm going to respond a little bit to it with some of my own thoughts. Uh, uh, there was an interesting conversation that I ended up having on LinkedIn, um, you know, one of those kinds of quasi-argumentative respectable professional conversations that you get into uh, and, and I thought there was a lot of interesting points raised and you know this is always a, a very highly contested subject and everyone has got a lot of thoughts and opinions on it um, I've, I feel from our side at Business of Architecture we're in quite a unique position where both myself and Enoch um, are you know we're trained architects we've had a career in architecture we've run our own architectural businesses and we've unplugged ourselves from the architecture industry a little bit in the sense that we're not currently practicing as architects and i do believe that that little bit of unplugging has given um i, I certainly feel like it gives me a a, a different perspective and paradigm on the architectural industry uh, and of course now we're we're in the very privileged position of being able to assist you know at the moment over 80 different clients around the world in the UK in the US with raising their fees with becoming more profitable with making more money in their practices um, and we've studied and trained from sales trainers to leadership trainers to entrepreneurs business people marketing consultants sales consultants um financial consultants cpas you know we've we've spent the last decade really amassing this body of knowledge about how to run an architecture practice and make it hum and make it work and that's what we that's what i do that's what i spend my entire every single working day is thinking about this, doing this and talking with clients and having them do things that they haven't done before to make more money and to get more profitable, more fulfilling, better, higher quality projects. This is my mission. I'm, I'm very, very passionate about this. And this is the thing that really excites me. So I, I like reading these kinds of articles. Now, the article is in the AJ. It's called When Will Architects Learn to Value Themselves Properly? It's by a guy called Tim Callahan, um, who is one of the founding directors of a London-based architecture firm called Nim Tim Architects. They do really beautiful um, work in the London area lots of kind of design worthy um, photographs that they get of their beautiful uh, extension projects to uh, things in, 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 in houses, terraced houses in London. And they do a lot of kind of very thoughtful social work and community projects. And, you know, you can just have a little look on their website just to get a sense of how vibrant and colorful they are as a practice. Very big practice, but I'm, I'm just gauging from the photograph here, it looks like there's about 12 people there. Have you ever had trouble finding an architectural photographer who could really make your project shine? Today's episode is sponsored by renowned architectural photographer, Tobin Davies. Tobin Davies eliminates the hassle by traveling to your location to create the stunning photographs your project deserves. And we are happy to support him here on the Business of Architecture podcast. Visit TobinDavies.com or BayawayPhotos.com to book a shoot in less than 10 minutes and ask about the special offer for Business of Architecture podcast listeners. Again, that's TobinDavies.com or BayawayPhotos.com. The article is is talking about Tim's kind of laying out a, a question like why have salaries and fees stagnated and while other professions uh, whilst the profession's responsibilities have actually increased. So if we kind of start to lay out some of the problems here that he goes through, he talks about a, a particular story at the beginning of last year where they were hiring for a part one, they put the salary out of £26,000, which was a living wage in London, but they got a lot of pushback about it. And I, I, you know, first of all, I commend them for putting the number out there because there's a lot of practices who are not putting the numbers out there. And I think this is a really important thing to be doing is actually, you know, being transparent of how much, you know, 
how much you're uh, going to be paying somebody. This is part of the marketing for the job role in the first place. And so, you know, I commend and acknowledge them for, for doing that. However, it came to bite them in the ass. And they were kind of, um, you know, there was a lot of pushback, a lot of practices, other, other architects, com- you know, telling them this is a, you know, this is unethical. This is not a living wage in London. And you're probably right. I mean, that 27,000 pounds as a, a part one is it's not a lot of money when you consider, you know, probably rent is going to be uh, no, <laughs> a small room. He puts here a small room in a shared house in zone two starts at 750 quid. That's half of your money gone already you know and it, we see recommendations for how much you should be spending on rent from your monthly wage and it's between 10 and 25 percent and it's just and this is just almost impossible on a salary of twenty six thousand. so they got nipped in the bum for that and you know they've done a, a, a good amount of work to you know i think they raised their they raised the salary there but it did start to prompt this conversation of like well let's just look at the architecture fees and how pathetic they are I've said this many, many times. We look at the RABA um, fee scales. We look at the salary guides, and they are woefully, pitifully low. Uh, we consider the enormous investment that you put into becoming an architect. You know, seven to ten years at max. You're going to have a load of debt anywhere between ten thousand to fifty thousand pounds or or more. Um, if you're studying in London, good luck. And then you're coming out on a salary which is barely livable in the major metropolis in the in the city. Now he goes on and compares this to other professions, and you know, I mean, I, I was always amazed. My brother worked works in finance, and um, when I was a young architect, I remember telling him my at the time. This is about. 14, 15 years ago, I was on 28,000 pounds as a, as a relatively newly qualified architect. I told my brother this and he was like, wow, we, at UBS Bank he was working at, he was like, we pay our graduates about 45K and they've just come fresh out of university. And I remember just feeling robbed, absolutely robbed, and just thinking, whoa, First of all, how did I not consider this as a reality of the of the architectural um, profession? I, I don't think I would have been that fussed about the poor pay if I absolutely adored being an architect and loved it in the in being in an office. And I worked at some great practices. Don't get me wrong; I really I did enjoy my time there. But it it wasn't what I'd been sold. And I you know I, I feel like a lot of university students. Um, kind of go through this very long, unnecessary, protracted process of becoming an architect. And the natural reality of being an architect is something quite, quite different. And it, there's all sorts of issues with the way that the current education system is is set up. And it's really, you know, we like to compare ourselves to these other professions. Um, I come from a family of um, of accountants. And I've often sat there with my parents and tried to explain to them how wildly different the world of education is in academic architecture compared to practice. And they'll often kind of have rebuttals and be like, well, you know, it's the same. My mother was a, uh, used to teach accountancy at a, kind of a, at, um, at colleges. And um, she'd always say, well, you know, it's, it's always very different the what you teach in university or what you teach in a college course to um, what actually is happening in real life. That is true. And uh, the, true, the same would be true for medicine and for law, I'm sure. However, what happens in architectural education is unrecognizable to what you would do in practice. Okay, it's nearly unrecognizable. Uh, I look at my own kind of architectural career. Again, I thoroughly enjoyed my architectural education and I appreciate the the benefits and the virtues of it. And there's another conversation here about the power of architectural thinking um, and kind of the way that you can analyze and look at problems and synthesize and be creative and all this kind of stuff. I'm just not entirely convinced that this long protracted um, indulgent education is that well suited for being a practicing architect, hence the kind of big, um, the big kind of cliff that you fall off when you come out of university, go into practice, getting paid not a lot of money, and you've got very little practical real life skills in to be used in an architecture office. Now, we're going to talk about salaries here, and the training that you get from university, okay, is part and parcel why your fee is so low. 
why your salary is low as a young architect because you don't know anything about the practice so you're not that valuable to an architecture firm on a side note here you might find that your architectural skills your cgi skills your creative synthesizing skills they might very well be better remunerated in another industry if you go and look at someone like Arca, out of architecture with um jake and erin they're, they're they're kind of consulting agency where they're taking architects out of architecture and putting them into other industries we're seeing incredible things where architects are very highly prized and valued in different industries particularly in tech tech just not tech is the kind of a major driver of capitalism at the moment, um, you're going to find, in many cases, a much better salary using your architectural skills. It's not a structured path, which is why it's more difficult, um, and there's more risk involved in it, and you need to be a little bit courageous with your career choices to go off and do that. But I think that's very, that's fascinating, and there's, there's a, you know, there's a lot of value there in, in, in the architectural education. However, when it comes to actually being a part one student, and in an architecture practice, a, a, a business owner struggles with the part one because they've got to train them so heavily. So my advice to a lot of smaller practices is don't hire part ones. Just don't do it because you're, it, on the surface of it, yes, you can pay them a small amount of money, but you're going to have to spend a year, maybe two years training them, um, get them to be able to do the things that you want them to do there's a big mindset shift of kind of being an individualist when you're at, at architecture school and the project's being about you and your kind of creative impetus that you want to follow through to then working in a team and having professional um, standards and regulations and code and then the, the kind of construction details which tends to be you know a lot of that gets missed out at university so people don't come into a practice actually you know a young architect doesn't really know that much about how buildings are put together in many cases you know and the university academics are very happy to say well you just picked up on the job our our job is to change the way that you think okay fair enough I and mean, there's there's a lot of validity in that as well it's just what do, do students realize this do students know this so you know part of the low salary of the architect uh, particularly at these early stages is because it's it's economically valued lowly okay it's economically lowly uh, valued lowly now you're you're as a young architect you know there's a big impetus on yourself to up level your skills and do whatever training you need to to, to do um you know the, the whole working from home thing i think at the moment for for younger architects is just a massively bad idea uh, I, I can't stress enough how much career development you will miss out by working in your bedroom um for the kind of you know for the short term for short term preference and comfort i would be very very wary of that we see it you know, I've rarely met many architecture practices. I'm not saying you can't do it. And, you know, business of architecture, we're a fully remote operation. And I know the, the difficulties with running a remote operation. It's not for everybody. And a lot of practices that have traditionally been in the studio based and now have moved into remote working and are kind of compromising with their team members have seen a definite dip in productivity. Um, and it's very difficult to be an architect in a bedroom and lead and manage people and to be able to negotiate and to be able to do all these things. So we've got to be very, very careful here as a young architect, like to protect your career trajectory and also, you know, just recognize the reality of the skills that are needed in a practice. You're often going to be missing them as a part one student. Hence, your salary reflects that. That might or might not be controversial now the, the going back to this article of tim's he's kind of comparing the pay disparity to other professions and also the, the the kind of modern architect is having ever more liability and responsibility and yet our fees are stagnating i, I i'm a little bit wary of architects continually comparing ourselves to other professions there's some major differences with say medicine and law, uh, just in the way that they're positioned, you know, the architect is not viewed as an immediate need, right? So law and certainly medicine, we can see it much more distinctly in medicine, where 
a, a doctor is a, you know, it's a need. It's a need now. You go to a doctor, you are, you're literally in physical pain or you're sick and you need to be cured. Okay, so there is a, there's a pain. In the world of marketing and sales, this is what we're interested in, in getting at. Okay, so a sophisticated, good salesperson understands the pains and the current problems that their client is in now. Okay, so a profession like medicine, okay, people are coming to you, your patients are coming to you, they are in physical pain. Okay, and the, the, often the, the kind of way that we talk about um, salesmanship and how to sell is not dissimilar to the diagnostic process that a doctor will go through with a patient. Okay, but the difference here is that with in, in medicine, with surgery, with all these kinds of um, jobs, there's a, a strong pain. Okay, it's, a, it's perceived as a need right now. Law is also very similar in this sense, where the kind of, in, you know, it's, it doesn't bear thinking about, you know, particularly in, let's say, corporate law, okay, the amount of money that can be lost by not hiring a lawyer or you recognize the value that a lawyer can do or you go to a lawyer because you've got a real problem on your hands right now okay you're being sued or you know there's a contract that you need to negotiate that's absolutely critical or you're going to lose a whole load of money there's often a sense of urgency so both of these professions have a, a kind of inbuilt sense of urgency and pain and i think that's really important just to make that as a distinction where because architects we don't our public perception isn't that, okay? So that is, that's our responsibility as salespeople to bring a bit of urgency and a bit of pain, okay? And when we're, able, when we're getting quite skilled at being able to do that, okay, and we've got to understand what the client's pain is, not our pains, okay? This is a, a kind of deeper conversation about communicating value. Going back to this article, Tim kind of points out here, you know, the low pay, how miserable it is for people. Um, he does kind of point towards some of the campaign groups such as Future Architect Front and the Section Architecture Workers, some of these unions that are happening here in the UK, um, how they've ushered a new conversation around pay and the kind of ex exploitation that often happens um, in successful or perceived ar uh, architecturally successful uh, practices. And I think that's quite an interesting Personally, I think there's a, a definite place in the profession for unions and they're not necessarily, they're not a bad thing, but I don't believe that they are going to be the massive change the profession needs because at the end of the day, and Tim kind of points to this in his article, what underpins low pay is ultimately low fees, okay? Now, there's a, a union will work in terms of it will, you know, it will start to force architects and architectural practices to be paying people a, a higher level of wage. The problem with that is going to be that there's simply going to be a whole lot of practices that simply can't and then they're, they're going to they're going to cease to remain basically which again is not necessarily a bad thing. The kind of pressure that 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 the unions put on the on a practice is good but but the solution to higher fees is salesmanship. Okay? So low pay is definitely as a result of low fees. Low fees are as a result of poor perceived value from the prospect. Poor perceived value from the prospect is a direct result of architects being crap at selling and marketing. Okay, now it was interesting because there was a, a little a little tete-a-tete -tete on the comments page that I got involved in here. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I, I appreciate and uh, thank everybody's kind of contributions and the conversations I had here. There's a lot of people who really want a top-down solution, okay? Again, there's a place for top-down solutions. So there was one architect here who was talking about how the UK must prevent those with, without the relevant qualifications from designing buildings, okay? And this is not a bad. This is not a bad thing. I'm, I'm, I'm fully for having more protection of function for the architect. I'm just not entirely convinced that it's going to solve all of the problems that we want in terms of having higher fees, winning work. Because at the end of the day, we're still businesses and we're still operating in a capitalistic system where we need to be able to be fully tooled up and conversant in 
negotiations, in sales, in positioning, being able to identify what the client's real pain points are, what their problems are, where they're struggling, help them quantify the value of the problems that they're experiencing. And that's quite a sophisticated and refined conversation that I don't see happening very often in the architecture world. Okay, we often kind of dismiss sales and, you know, it, it, either as being something that's someone's got the gift of the gab or they're naturally charismatic or in the architecture industry, we're very lazy with our selling. We just kind of rely heavily on portfolios and we do the dog and pony show and then we're very lazy with our proposals where it's a kind of hope and quote. And when I say lazy, what I mean by lazy is that it's, you know, it's, it's email negotiation, it's sending out a, a price, there's not much thought about the psychology of how your fee is being presented to somebody. Oh, and then guess what happens? Well, then you lose out to somebody, you've put together a poorly thought out proposal, you haven't negotiated, you haven't um, determined what the pain points are of the clients, you're not doing any of this face to face. Okay, you send out a proposal with your fee on it, clients kind of forgotten about the experience. Maybe you might have had an emotional connection that might stand you in a bit of good ground. Okay. But then lo and behold, guess what happens? Somebody else comes in, a client can't tell the difference between your proposal and a proposal from another organization, which is offering quite a different service. And they go with, with the other person. Okay. So if that's an experience that architects are having, okay, that's something that we need to train ourselves for and prepare for. And in the world of marketing and sales, that's what marketing sales is about. Learning how to negotiate, learning how to walk the client through things, learning how to educate the client with an ecosystem of marketing collateral and thought leadership, being able to present certain things as offers. All of this, is, again, it's not, a, it's not a, a quick, easy fix. And there's no shortage of consultants right now at the moment, you know, Business of Architecture, we're one of them, where we're, where we're spending a lot of time with practices, helping them develop the right marketing collateral and the right sales systems, the right prospecting systems, a, a, an intelligent, thoughtful strategy for going after work, how to start those kind of conversations and not just being reactive with our sales and marketing or, or even just reactive to the kind of uh, RFPs that come our way or competition entries. All of this just puts us in a, when we're reactive like that, that just puts us in a very weak position to be able to negotiate higher fees and to be able to um, win work against other unqualified, I think that was one of the big complaints here in the in the comment section, was that we're losing out a lot of work to underqualified architects or architectural technologists or people who just aren't even qualified in any kind of architecture whatsoever. I think that was one of the real complaints. So the the kind of argument there was the, the, the top down need for more regulation to uh, ensure that all you know every sort of building project must have an architect involved i'm again that would be lovely i mean we work with loads of practices in countries where there is that kind of regulation in in place and they still the industry still struggles with low fees and competition and all sorts of other financial problems you know i, I like i like this article that tim wrote and it's definitely you know he kind of ends it with this rallying cry if you like that we need to start recognizing the value that we bring and setting our fees accordingly and absolutely we need to do that i, I don't think though architects don't realize their value it's just that the business skills the marketing the selling the negotiation skills have been totally ignored or worse you think you know we think we are good salespeople. And that, that's really the engine here of being able to set higher fees. So I, I thought I'd just kind of give a few ideas as well of how we can start to recognize our value and how we can start to set our fees accordingly. And again, at Business of Architecture, we do a year long program called the Smart Practice Method, where we go in very deep into all of these topics. So in the space of this podcast, I'm, I'm I'm only going to scratch the surface really on the sorts of strategies that are that are needed but let's have a look so the first thing i would advise to raising your fees is simply 
to start raising your fees, to start raising them. Okay, now that scares the living bejesus out of a lot of people. Okay, we're going to talk about being accurate with your fees and understanding the financial metrics and optics that you need to have in your business so that you can set your fees accurately and you can understand what's going into them and you can predict them. You know, if you're not doing timekeeping and that kind of stuff, time tracking and doing it accurately and having team members distinguish between direct labor and indirect labor, I mean, it's just going to be hard. Life is going to be hard. Okay. But the first thing that we can all do is simply start just by raising your fees. And we want to be raising our fees in line with inflation in each year at least. Okay. Now, the, the pushback I will always hear from this is, you know, all oh, our market can't sustain that. It's going to be impossible. Great. Okay. If you're charging what you're worth, you are going to get some friction. And we need to learn to be okay with losing a, a client because you're charging what you're worth. And when you're charging what you're, what you're worth, you're going to get a little bit of friction involved in it. That's where becoming a good negotiator, a good salesperson, a good conversationalist, a good orator, being able to do these things face to face. This is where these skills massively, massively come into play. In a lot of businesses outside of architecture, the business development or the salesperson is often the person whose salary can be asymmetrically rewarded to their output. Okay, because they're so valuable. A really good salesperson is absolutely essential to any business. When you look at um, a lot of great CEOs, um, a lot of really good CEOs, they've, they've cut their teeth, if you like, being having some kind of sales experience. Okay, so the selling is super, super important in running a business and in capitalism. We can't undermine it, we can't underestimate it. And as an architect, I hate to tell it to you, but you are selling all the time. Okay, literally the first com communication you have with that client right until you hand over the keys or the, the, they walk into the building, you are selling them on something all the way through. So it makes a lot of sense to become masterful in, this, in the skill sets of, of selling. The problem of selling is that most of us have experienced terrible salespeople in every walk of life, from buying a car to buying a computer to going into a retail store. And we're tarnished with the with these kinds of horrific experiences and being taken advantage of. And you know, the vast majority of salespeople are not salespeople, in my opinion. They've just fallen into that kind of line of work and are trying to talk you into something. And a sophisticated salesperson is in, in part an educator that is in part therapy, in part performance. Um, and you're an amazing listener and you're an advisor. Okay. And you're, you're able to understand very deeply what is happening at the root of a client's problem. Okay. So there's a, a wonderful book called Never Split the Difference by a guy called Chris Foss, who was a FBI negotiator. If, if, if I recommend one sales book to get people started on, read that because it really goes into the beautiful linguistic conversational tactics that the FBI had developed in negotiating with terrorists and, um, you know, kind of life and death situations with people who were armed robbers and things like that. Uh, and they had to develop a system that worked. Um, otherwise, people would lose their lives. And the, Chris Foss is, was one of the head negotiators in the FBI, and he kind of outlines the strategic um, processes that that they use there for talking to these kinds of high-pressure criminal situations. And the underlying psychology of, of it is really what we need to be mastering in our architecture firms. Otherwise, we're gonna we're gonna struggle. So, first thing is. Simply start by rise, raising your fees. We want to get into the practice and getting and just get used to raising our fees annually. The ARB's got no problem of raising their fees on you. Um, lawyers don't have any problem raising their fees. There's no reason why architects shouldn't be collectively raising our fees. Okay. And yes, if you're going to be losing projects to people who are undercutting you, you've got to start taking some responsibility for that. You've got to start taking responsibility for the fact that your sales process and your business marketing and operations haven't aren't good enough they're not good enough to communicate the the value that you're offering you don't understand the pain points of the of the client well enough okay or you're just in the wrong market why 
you know, sometimes I speak to a lot of architects and we, we kind of do an analysis and audit of the sorts of projects that they're going after. And we're just like, why are you, why are you dicking around in, after these crappy jobs? Why are you fighting here? Like, why? That's just, that's a hard life. It's a hard life, okay? So part of it is positioning, part of it is sales, sales skills. There's going to be, you know, there are certain types of clients that you're not going to be able to charge a, a massive fee for, for doing, their, for doing their rear extension, right? So you've got to start being strategic with the kinds of people that you want to be getting in front of and, and get very clear on who it is that would be your target market where they've got a lot of money and they can, they can do work that's fulfilling for you and start getting very clear on what a tier A project looks like in your business. So that would be number two, would be get very clear with what a tier A project looks like. Okay, what are the attributes? Who is it that you're, off, that you're, going, that you're going after? Okay, so number one was simply practice, start raising your fees, be prepared um, to get some pushback, realize, understand that the next part of of uh, developing and raising your fees is going to be in marketing skills, communication skills, understanding the client's perception of value and their pain points. Once we can have grown up mature conversations around that, great. Now we're starting to get into a position where we can raise our fees. The next thing I would say as well with raising fees is just learn to negotiate face to face. So I recommended that book just now, very useful. It's talking about kind of conversational tactics that you can use. And I think one of the biggest problems that I see with architects is that they're negotiating via email. They're just sending out a proposal. There's no psychology based in the proposal. Again, there's loads of consultants out there. I mean, I highly recommend Blue Turtle if you want to learn how to really um, up level your proposal writing and kind of, you know, deeply embed it with a load of psychology. Um, you know, if you do that and you've got kind of really solid proposals where you're, you know, perhaps you're using the kind of a tiered pricing system and you're negotiating face-to-face, -face, fantastic, fantastic. But the negotiating face-to-face -face is really, really important. Um, and it's one of these things that, again, you really need to see it to believe it as well. I've been very blessed to be able to kind of work with um, some incredible sales trainers and incredible negotiators and, and you know, be involved in those negotiations with them. And when you see someone doing it at that kind of masterful level, it's beautiful to watch. Um, and it's, it's not the kind of secondhand salesperson or a dog and pony show. It's more like a therapeutic, emotional um, conversation where where real honesty is happening between two people and you're getting really real about it. And you're laying out a very clear conversational structure from the beginning um, and you're leading the conversation. You know where you're going, you've got, you've got ideas, you've rehearsed, you've practiced um, different objections. You're masterful in being able to ask questions. I think if there's one thing, one kind of defining factor of being a good negotiator face to face is you've got to be good with asking questions. You've got to be good at being able to um, turn a question that's orientated to you back into a question for the, for the client, for the prospect. Okay, that's a technique that we call reversing. So that's really important, just learning to negotiate face to face. If you're not negotiating face to face um, and you're not skilled in, in, in that, then we've got a problem. The next in idea, if you like, to raising our fees is that, well, our fees need to be based on the value that we're providing to the client. Okay, and this conversation of communicating value, normally what I see architects say, we need to learn how to communicate our value better. What that means is that we go off onto these long rants about you know, how important it is to have an architect um, in these situations, how to, you know, we talk about sustainability, we talk about the wider context of buildings, quality. That's all great. It's just not the immediate pain of most of our clients. So this is where the 
asking questions is super, super important. And why in many cases, like a diagnostic service, so the really sophisticated architects, they go out and they've got diagnostic um, services, they're proactive with their with the client base, they researching trends. You listen to the hundreds of um, um, interviews we've got on business of architecture where you know you've hear again and again and again um, these these architects who have got you know massively profitable businesses. They are up there proactive with their business development. They're going to, you know, if they work with developers, they go to seminars with developers. They understand the, the developer industry. They understand the language that they speak. They understand the pain points. They understand the current trends that are emerging. They go deep into understanding the field of their desired client and they learn what the what, what's value perceived to them. The sales conversation then becomes uh, a, a kind of series of questions where they are helping the prospect discover for themselves afresh these kind of pains and they're able to articulate them very, very well, right? So uh, again, I'm just a, a little example of this, you know, for a, a developer, one of the pain points, and I've seen one of our clients do this very, very well, uh, a, a common pain point for a developer is the timing of finance that they're getting from their investors. They often don't have that much money for the soft costs up front in a project. Hence, you know, this is why architects get themselves into problems with doing for free work. And But the architect only kind of half negotiates there because they're doing free work with the hope of just winning the project. You know, that's not really very good negotiating. Um, we had a client recently who would negotiate. They understood that the front end part of financing for the developer client was was quite painful. They went into a long conversation about how many um, kind of planning delays had cost them, cost the developer a lot of money, and they were very skilled in being able to get the developer to share these kinds of um, uh, these these problems. Okay, again, the the skilled negotiator is someone who is able to have the other person share these intimate um, problems and go deep into it. Okay, again, this is all part and parcel of those conversational skills which you can, you can learn and you can, you can train. Our client was very good at kind of pulling out these pain points, understood that the, there was problems with the front end finance, negotiated a, a deal where I was like, okay, well you pay me a base level um, and then you can pay me on the approvals when we get approvals and actually what we'll do is for every unit that I get approved onto the site, why don't we do a little bonus structure? Okay. Now, if you're running a good business that's got good cash flow, that's solid, um, you can start to be more creative with these kinds of deals and take more risks in the way that you're negotiating. And they negotiated a number of um, kind of uh, bonuses per unit that gets on the site and hey presto, same amount of work um, and they're collecting you know, somewhere between two and a half, three times the amount of money that they would have done if they just charged for it in a, in a regular way. Okay, so just understanding, we listened to the podcast I did with Joe Cowan years ago, um, you know, that's what she was so sophisticated and so brilliant at doing. She understood the pains of her client and she adapted her, her fees and the, her offer specifically to help the client solve those kinds of problems where lots of other architects weren't, were oblivious to it. Okay, so just a bit of financial literacy here. This is, again, the, the kind of business skills, the financial skills. You know, the more kind of competent you become in talking about business, the more you have uh, at your disposal to be able to negotiate with. Okay, the better insight that you have in being able to pinpoint and go deep with a kind of client's set of pains and problems. The other thing I would, I would kind of say as well is to get a handle on your multipliers. Okay, so this is now a kind of bit of accounting and financial literacy that's really needed with architects. So many architects are just kind of licking their fingers, putting it in the air and just pulling out a number of what their fees are. If you're not doing time tracking and not doing it regularly and not doing it um, accurately, that's the first thing. Uh, just, just get it set up, okay? Just tomorrow, immediately, as soon as you um, get off listening to this podcast, Go and get time tracking tools. Um, if you've got that already set up and people haven't, aren't doing it, then you just got to, however you do it, whether you do it with incentives or you do it with, with punitive measures, um, you've got to get everyone in the team. And that includes you doing accurate and, and up-to-date timekeeping. Because that's 
golden Okay, because that starts to give you a lot of data and a lot of information about the past performance on projects, um, how much hours were actually being used, which is going to help you put together realistic fee proposals. Now, a good negotiator, when you're putting together your fee proposals, will negotiate in space to renegotiate your fees. All right. Now, that's something that kind of sounds a lot of it, for those of you who are who are skilled negotiators that's almost kind of very obvious for people who are not skilled negotiators and like to hide behind an email and just punt out a proposal and just hope for the best and never want to talk about it again this is something to really kind of think about okay because if you negotiate at the beginning periods to renegotiate the project fantastic Okay, now you're kind of starting to communicate with the, with the client that this is a moving target. It's not a product as much as they wish it was a product. It's not a product, it's a complex, it's a complex service that's moving around. And part of your negotiations needs to accommodate that and to put in mechanisms that are very clearly laid out on how you are going to deal with scope creep or renegotiate fees. Okay, again, a business of architecture will spend about three months going into a, a whole load of different strategies and training people in how to actually do that. But first up, know your multipliers. So know what your hourly billing rate for each individual employee. Okay, so that means each hour that you're billing out a team member, there's 30% profit or at least 20% profit that's already baked into that hour. Okay, now there's lots of... Um, kind of hourly billing calculators that are that are available we've got some at business of architecture this stuff is absolutely critical for you to know what the hourly billing rate for each of your uh, employees needs to be where you've baked in at least 20 percent okay and if you've got that then that becomes the basic building block of working out your fees then you can use something like a project fee budget calculator. So everybody should have some kind of spreadsheet. If you look at Steve Winter, P2P system, um, there's some kind of real good industry standard uh, um, project fee calculators that are, that are available. Again, we have them here at Business of Architecture. But having those kinds of tools where you've got an hourly billing calculator, you understand what your break-even multiplier is, you understand what your overhead multiplier is and your, uh, your profit multipliers and then your net profit multiplier. Again, I'm not going to go into what those terms are here. Google them when you get off this, um, in this podcast, kind of familiarize yourself with what those numbers mean. Essentially, they're, they're factors by which you're going to multiply what you're paying someone to do the work that their client then pays you to. Uh, pays you so that you can cover your costs and you can make your profit right so that's it's not complicated it's not complicated mathematically but we do need to be aware of it and we do need to be building up our fees with some kind of logic and we need to be able to uh, negotiate some flexibility into your fees so if you're a practice that's charging on a percentage of construction i quite like this actually as a way of uh, um billing of billing your clients is charging on a percentage of construction but you've got to be shit hot at negotiating and explaining and educating the client all the way through about what the formula is that you're using to work out your fees and you've got to eliminate the element of surprise okay you've got to eliminate surprise with all of this stuff with your with your clients so again your upfront negotiations um are so so key Getting the mechanics right, knowing your multipliers, knowing your, your financial literacy, having good data to make sure that it's accurate, good. We're, we're starting to get into some good shape here. And just again, I'm just going to reiterate the, the point. The sales conversation, so much happens in that sales conversation. And normally it's, it's just left out for most architects. Hence why the rest of the project is so flipping difficult. Okay, you can solve and prevent so many problems with good, solid negotiations. Okay, you can start every single project off with an expectations review or an expectations meeting where you sit down at the very least, sit down with the client and just go point out elements of the contract that they've just agreed to that are really, really important for them to understand. 
don't be afraid to repeat this information again and again and again. We can automate this repetition with videos and explainers and things like that, but nothing works as well as actually sitting down with somebody face to face, having them explain, you know, you explain to them, giving them an opportunity to, for them to ask questions and for them to acknowledge and accept what it is that their responsibilities are. A conversation like that at the beginning of a project can save an architecture practice thousands and thousands of pounds, okay? And it's all part and parcel of being a responsible, sophisticated, refined negotiator, salesperson, and marketeer. That's all for now. Um, go and check out that article by Tim uh, Callahan uh, in the AJ, and um, I look forward to talking to you guys very shortly. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. Have you ever been frustrated with architectural photographers who aren't reliable or don't capture your projects the way that you'd hoped? Visit TobinDavies.com or BOAPhotos.com to book renowned architectural photographer Tobin Davies to photograph your next project. Tobin Davies travels to your location and specializes in architectural photography for modern, design-focused architecture. Again, visit TobinDavies.com or BOAPhotos.com to get more information or book your shoot today. And tell them you heard about him here on the podcast for a complimentary package upgrade. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.